One of the problems of discussing recent American history is we have no way of knowing what is important and what isn't from a historical perspective. What will be, we be including in history lessons 100 years from now? We just do not know. And so when we talk about modern presidents, all we can do is list what we think were significant events during their presidency. It may turn out not to be so. Bush II is criticized for the war in Iraq, but it may turn out within a hundred years that that was the start of moderation of radical Islam. We just don't know. So when we talk about the modern presidents, it's really just kind of guesswork as to what might be significant in the future. Bush One's popularity soared after the success of the war against Iraq. However, the economy finally got to him. Between Reagan's big deficit and the recession, the economy became the issue of the presidential election. And he was not able to turn the economy around. That was not his fault, but he had to go back on his pledge not to raise taxes. And there was a big tax increase to try to pay off the debt that Reagan had run up, and that proved highly unpopular with the American people. And so Bill Clinton ran his campaign on the slogan, it's the economy, stupid. And the economy was bad enough that he won. When the domestic terrorist, Timothy McVeigh, bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. It brought out one of Clinton's greatest strengths. He was ridiculed for his phrase, I feel your pain. But the American people believed it. He had empathy. And the American people felt like that he truly was hurting along with them. And so the Oklahoma City bombing proved to be a big point in keeping President Clinton popular. As for the economy, Clinton came into office at a very fortunate time for him. We were not engaged in any, in any overseas wars. And so he got what was called a peace dividend because over 60% of the federal budget was for defense. He was able to cut defense spending. Therefore, he was able to reduce government spending substantially. At the same time, he raised taxes. And therefore, as you'll note in this chart, the income of the government under Clinton much exceeded the spending of the government, and therefore he was able to, by the end of his second term, turn over a balanced budget to the next president. He also was fortunate in that the United States was just entering what was called the dot-com boom. That is the explosion of the internet as an economic tool, online shopping and things like that were just beginning during Clinton's years as president. And that created incredible demand for workers in the technology fields and spurred the economy so that he was fortunate in that he had a growing new segment of the economy no war so he could cut government spending, 
and therefore balance the budget. Clinton's first years in office were marked by both triumph and defeat. He tried to get through a health care bill providing health care to all Americans. He put his wife Hillary in charge of that legislation, and it failed. However, he was able to get Congress to approve the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA. NAFTA basically said that there would be no economic barriers between Canada, Mexico, and the United States so that things manufactured in Canada could be shipped into the United States with no tariff. The same thing with Mexico. And the same thing with goods made in America could be exported to Canada or Mexico without any barriers. This was seen as a huge economic benefit for all three countries. However, Union uh, labor unions were not a big fan because they felt like it just opened the way for the further exporting of manufacturing jobs, particularly to Mexico. And so while NAFTA did make the United States, Canada, and Mexico one big trading partner, it did hurt because some of the jobs went to those other countries and left the United States. Two years into the Clinton presidency, and in no small part because of the failure of his health care program, the Republicans in the mid-year elections took control of Congress. They did it with promises to the American people. Newt Gingrich, who would become the Speaker of the House of Representatives when the Republicans took control, put forth a contract with America, as he called it. It was a conservative agenda that promised to reduce the federal government. Among other items in the contract with America was the promise that they would get government waste under control by having an independent audit. It tried to cut the number of House committees and the bureaucracy of getting legislation passed. It required a three-fifths majority vote to increase taxes in any way. And it promised that Congress would be held to the same laws that regular Americans had to follow. For example, it was not illegal and still is not to this day for Congress to use information that they get in secret to invest in the stock market. We have seen recent cases where uh, people in Congress dumped a bunch of stock right before the stock market crash about the coronavirus. And they had been in private congressional meetings discussing what the possible impact of the virus would be. Well, that is still legal, but in the contract of America, the Republicans promised if they took office, they would stop that practice. They did not. In fact, their promise of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution never took place. They accomplished virtually nothing that they had promised in the contract with America, but the American people were in a mood for less government, less bureaucracy. And so the contract with America was popular with the American voters and the Republicans took control of Congress. <laughs> 
This got into the press. The president denied it. The Republicans in Congress called for an impeachment investigation. And they believed that they had caught the president lying about whether or not he had an affair. He had had an affair. And so they impeached him for perjury. The Senate did not convict. So Clinton was not removed from office. However, fighting the impeachment took up most of the energy of his second four years as president. And therefore, they were not particularly successful or productive. Clinton was a master politician. He could read the political breeze before virtually anyone else. He was able to be popular with the American people. That got him elected twice. But he did not have a great deal of accomplishment during his period as president. Here's a summary of the Clinton presidency. To further conclude our look at the Clinton presidency, I'm going to turn to Crash Course and let them give you an overview of his accomplishments and his failures. I don't know how many of you have ever seen something like this. This is a punch card ballot, and it was widely used in the 1990s and 2000s, because what would happen is to place your vote, whether it be for the baseball all-star game or for the presidential election, you would punch out a hole in the card. Then it would be run through a machine that read which holes had been punched out, 
and that then that machine recorded who you had voted for based on the holes that were punched out. However, in the 2000 election, this punch card ballot became an issue. You can look on here and you see a couple of places where the paper is not completely out of the hole. Those became known as hanging chads because when the, when the cards were stacked on top of each other, that paper that was not completely punched out was pushed back into the hole. Thus, when the machine read it, it did not record who the person voted for because it read it as a hole that had not been punched. This became the central issue in deciding whether Al Gore or George W. Bush would become president of the United States. Gore won the popular vote by several hundred thousand votes. However, in the Electoral College, it was too close to call, and it all came down to the state of Florida. Whichever candidate won Florida would win the election. Now, Bush had something of an inside in Florida because the Secretary of State, who was the person in charge of counting the ballots, was also the state campaign chairman for George W. Bush. His brother, Jeb Bush, was also the governor of the state of Florida. However, as this video explains, the voting in Florida was too close, and so they had to go to recounts, and they had to go to hand counts, where they would try to look at those punch card ballots and decide if a vote had really been cast or not. It created a huge mess that ultimately, when the state of Florida cut off the deadline for the recount and was challenged by Gore, it went to the United States Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, the vote was five to four. Five conservative justices saying, yes, stop the recount. Four liberal justices saying, the recount must continue. And therefore, in essence, the Supreme Court decided that George W. Bush would become president by a vote of five to four. Again, I will differentiate between the presidents Bush by calling Bush one and Bush two. That will apply even on exams. Bush two refers to the son, George W. Bush. And he followed Ronald Reagan's pattern when it came to the economy. He pushed through a huge tax cut bill, primarily for the wealthy and for businesses and corporations. And the results were similar to what had happened under Ronald Reagan. The gap between the rich and the poor just increased. So that during his eight years in office, the number of Americans living in poverty increased from 31% to 37%. Following the Reagan playbook, he also deregulated the banks and allowed them to loan money as they wished. This was great for the banks, but it was not so great for those who were trying to uh, get a loan because much of the lending went to the rich people, not ordinary citizens. And so the Bush economic plan can really be called Reagan 2.0. It was trickle down economics, but the money usually did not trickle down to the working class and the poor. The rich got richer, 
everybody else stayed the same or lost ground. On 9-11-2001, everything changed, not just for the Bush administration, but for the entire country and the entire world. It didn't seem quite as important anymore that the economic policies that were putting in, being put into place, programs like No Child Left Behind that had tried to bring about improved student performance through standardized testing. All of those things moved to the back burner when planes smashed into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York and they collapsed. For those of us who are old enough to remember 9-11, it is one of those days that will live in our memory for it forever. Kind of like for the baby boomers when uh, the day that Kennedy was assassinated. For the uh, uh, Generation Y, the day that the Challenger exploded. Or for the greatest generation, the day that Pearl Harbor happened. That is seared into our memory. <clears throat> I can remember walking into work that day and the televisions were on and the buildings were, or one building was on fire. And then sitting and watching on television as the second plane went into the second building and continuing to watch as the buildings collapsed. Nobody knew who had done this but it became very apparent quickly that this was the work of terrorists. And the world changed. In a speech after 9-11, President Bush declared war on terrorism. And he let it be known in that speech that he did not blame just Al-Qaeda, the organization headed by Osama bin Laden, that had been found to be responsible for the attacks of 9-11, but that he would also blame any country that allowed or supported these terrorist groups to operate. And therefore, he was declaring a war, not just seeking to bring the perpetrators to justice, but a war on terrorism. As part of that war on terrorism, he persuaded Congress to pass the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act largely increased the federal government's policing power to make America secure, but by making America secure, it was also imposing certain restrictions on United States citizens. For example, any of you who have gone to a concert or a ball game or gotten on an airplane know that you now have to go through a security check. Sometimes you have to take off your shoes and your belt and that sort of thing to get through. That is all part of what began after 9-11, to try to secure the homeland, or as this picture says, protecting the homeland. And the Patriot Act increased federal power to do that. However, as this video shows, some Americans thought that this was an invasion of their privacy, that the federal government was now becoming too powerful to violate our civil rights. This is a commentary from Fox News, not some liberal MSNBC, from Fox News, talking about what the Patriot Act allows the federal government to do. 
one of the classic stories that hit the headlines after the passage of the Patriot Act was a young college student flying home from uh, for Thanksgiving vacation. And she was taking an Islamic studies course. So in her suitcase, she packed an English translation of the Quran and her textbook for the class. TSA opened her suitcase and found those books and she was re detained and held for questioning as a possible terrorist because the TSA now had the power to, ins to go through her personal belongings and extract these books. You might also note that under the Patriot Act, and I don't know if you use this language anymore, but a few years ago, calling something that was great the bomb was all in style. And so people leaving a concert, for example, that would tweet, uh, the concert was the bomb, or the concert at AT&T Stadium was the bomb. They would have Homeland Security people show up on their doorstep the next morning because they were using keyword searches to inspect all electronic communications. And the place name and the word bomb would have been enough to bring out investigators. So here's what the Patriot Act does. Bush II also started a new way of thinking about the United States role in world affairs. It was called the Bush Doctrine, and part of the doctrine was the doctrine of preemption. What that meant was we would no longer wait to get attacked before we responded. That if we felt like some country was threatening to attack us, that we had justification to attack them first, to preempt their terrorist attack. And it was this doctrine of preemption that led us into the second Iraq war because the Bush administration came to believe that Saddam Hussein was backing terrorists, that he was making what were called weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, like atomic weapons or poison weapons, and that he was gonna give those to terrorist groups to use. Now, later on, it turned out that none of that was true, but that's what the Bush administration believed. And so they used the doctrine of preemption to send the US Army into Iraq overthrow Saddam Hussein in what became known as the Iraq War. Unlike his father, who was an experienced hand at international affairs, Bush too did not see the danger in removing Saddam Hussein. You recall that Bush I had stopped after driving the Iraq forces out of Kuwait he did not continue and overthrow Saddam Hussein as he could have done. But he realized that by overthrowing that dictator, he would destabilize the political situation in the entire Middle East. Bush too had no such concerns. And so he sent the US Army in, he took out Saddam Hussein, and the expectation for Bush and the Bush administration, including his vice president, Dick Cheney, was that we would be welcomed as liberating heroes, that we would go in, overthrow Saddam, turn things back over to the uh, Iraqis, and come home. What happened in reality was something different. with the expectation that the Iraqis would take over the government, 
and that we had freed them from dictatorships so they would naturally become a democracy, President Bush declared mission accomplished after Saddam Hussein was overthrown. But in reality, what happened was that removing the dictator loosened the ancient rivalries that were Iraq. Three major groups or tribes, if you will, the Kurds, the Shias, and the Sunnis. Now, Shias and Sunnis are kind of alike uh, the difference between Protestants and Catholics. They're both Muslim, but they have been fighting for centuries over what brand of Islam to follow, should be followed. And so in reality, what we got caught in was a civil war in Iraq with both sides targeting the United States. And so we had a mess. We were trying to do what was called nation building to create an Iraq in our own image as a democratic uh, government of the people. And what we got was civil war with us caught in the middle. When it became clear that none of the things that we had gone into Iraq to prevent, like the use of WMDs, like the Iraqi government supporting terrorist organization. When it was proven that none of that was true, Americans began to second guess, well, why did we go into the war at all? And so they began to push administration. This opposition to our military presence in the Middle East continued to grow as incidents like Abu Ghraib prison came to light. At Abu Ghraib, American soldiers and interrogators were imp imprisoning suspected terrorists and questioning them. And we began to use what the Bush administration would call enhanced interrogation techniques. Most other countries in the world call them torture. So you see some of the techniques here, the humiliation, a woman soldier leading an Arab man around on a leash, the use of cattle prods to burn people, forcing people to stand in uncomfortable positions for days at a time. At the upper left, you see waterboarding, where a person is strapped down and a cloth is put over their face and water is poured into the cloth until they feel like they are drowning. These were all acceptable enhanced interrogation techniques under the Bush administration. Their definition of torture was if it did permanent harm, not just temporary harm, to the person being questioned. <clears throat> this raised the question then of, of, was this a good thing for the United States to engage in? More and more of the American people came to feel like, no, it wasn't. And so now we were caught with our military presence trying to nation build in Afghanistan and in Iraq. One of the byproducts of our attack into Iraq was that we used military bases in Saudi Arabia. And the, some Fundamentalist Saudis felt like that was violating their sacred ground to have Americans there. One of those who was 
alienated and came to hate the United States because of our presence in Saudi Arabia was the son of one of the nobility of Saudi Arabia. His name was Osama bin Laden. <coughs> and it was American presence in Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War that turned him into a hater of the United States and someone who was avowed to bring down the great Western Satan. While conducting the war on terror, Bush too also took on things like climate change. Being in the oil business, Bush too did not believe that climate change was caused by fossil fuels. And therefore he refused to do anything to uh, lessen the use of fossil fuels and its carbon imprint. President Clinton had agreed to the so-called Kyoto Protocols, which was an international effort to reduce greenhouse gases in response to climate change. But it was not ratified by the United States while Clinton was president. So when it came to Bush II, Bush II refused to endorse it and pulled the United States out of this international agreement to prevent climate change. When the Class V hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, and flooded virtually the entire city, the federal government was very slow to respond. <clears throat> and when they did respond, they were not very effective in their response. FEMA, the emergency management people, said, well, we're gonna send in some trailers for people to live in, but those trailers sat in Arkansas until they rotted. People were dying on rooftops, and there was very little federal response. <clears throat> and so because of Katrina, Bush too had a growing reputation of not caring particularly about everyday people. And his administration got a reputation for not being good at meeting national crises. In retrospect, it has been found that no government reacted very well to the disaster of Katrina, state, local, or federal. But it was the federal response that really began making people question could the federal government get done what it was supposed to do? Or had it become a hollow shell, unable to really impact the American people in a positive way? In 2007, things seemed to be going all right with the economy. Yes, the Bush administration had faced other challenges, but in 2007, the economy collapsed. His response was to try to help corporations stay in business. What happened was that with deregulation, banks had begun lending money, particularly home mortgages, to people who could marginally afford to pay off their loans. Then when the economy started to go bad and people were losing their jobs, they couldn't pay their debts. And the banks were left holding large debts that they could not collect. They ended up foreclosing on thousands of homes, leaving people homeless. <clears throat> 
And this just spiraled downward into what has been called the greatest stock market crash since the Great Depression. The financial collapse of 2007-8 was responsible for the decline in the popularity of Bush II, and it will help Barack Obama be elected president. As a summary of Bush II explains, the financial crisis caused by greedy banks and insurance companies was his last attempt to save the financial industry and the economy. The response of many Americans to the financial crisis and to the bailout of the corporations, but not the people, was called Occupy Wall Street. It was a protest of the federal government not helping people, but helping corporations. This occurred during the Obama administration because Barack Obama, while he had put through a huge stimulus package to put people to work, he had also continued to help the financial industry that was still in trouble. And so some saw Obama as caring more about Wall Street and corporations and not the rights of the people. This helped to fuel the protests that the rich were getting bailed out and ordinary people were being left to suffer. The election of our first black president, Barack Obama, also triggered activism in the African-American community because they felt like now they had a president that understood their problems. And so groups like Black Lives Matter in response to police violence against African-Americans began to push the Obama administration to not just have a national agenda, but to over have a black agenda as well. He resisted this call, although his Justice Department did step up its investigation and prosecution of race and hate crimes. He did improve programs for minorities, but he maintained that he had a national agenda of rights for all people, not just for Mexican Americans or women or African Americans. Perhaps the biggest program of the Obama administration was the passage of the Health Care Act called Obamacare. And basically, Obama believed, as Democrats had since Franklin Roosevelt had first put it forth, that access to health care was a right of every citizen, not just for those who could afford it. And he tried to get some kind of a health care plan through. But in the Affordable Care Act, he had to compromise. And so it became kind of a public-private partnership where the for-profit health insurance companies would continue to provide health care insurance. For those who could not get insurance through their employer or could not afford to pay for it on their own, he set up a government-subsidized marketplace 
where people could get health care insurance at a reduced rate. It was highly controversial and still to this day is. President Trump has vowed to do away with Obamacare, but he could not get it through the Republican-controlled Congress. So it was highly controversial. A lot of the problems with it were, was the federal government competent enough to take on providing you with health care? And so it remains controversial. It did help millions of people who had formerly been shut out of being able to afford health insurance to get health insurance. But the results were mixed largely because of the compromises that Obama had to make to get it through Congress. That's why you are hearing in the presidential election this year, Bernie Sanders carrying on about universal health care, health care for all, much as other countries like Canada and Great Britain have. But in the United States, we have this halfway measure that has become known as Obamacare. While Obama had a number of successes, for example, he got the Supreme Court to rule the Bush era Defense of Marriage Act that prohibited gay marriage, the Supreme Court ruled that unconstitutional, thus opening the way for gay marriages. He had a number of other accomplishments like that. However, most of his policies were through executive order and not through legislation because the Republicans pretty much blocked passage of Obama bills. And so a lot of his success or failure was in the form of executive orders and increased use of the Justice Department to bring about more equity, more fairness, for instance, in support of Black Lives Matter. And so while he was an effective president, he was not able to get a lot of major legislation passed during his presidency. In the presidential election of 2016, businessman Donald Trump ran against President Obama's Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Once again, Hillary Clinton won the most popular votes, but Donald Trump won the Electoral College and therefore became president. It is much too early to draw any conclusions about the impact of the Trump presidency. We can look at some of the issues that he was elected on. Repeal and replace Obamacare. That has partially been done, but mostly by the courts and not by the legislature. He did push through a massive tax decrease, but it was primarily for the rich and for the corporations. Building the border wall, still highly debated and not nearly completed. He has succeeded in changing the Supreme Court by appointing judges to the Supreme Court who are very conservative. And therefore, the Supreme Court has moved further to the right than it had been. Fixing inner cities, not much has happened. Energy independence, we have increased our 
energy independence, but it has mostly been through Obama era type green energy. Trump's support for using coal and fossil fuels has not been a huge impact on increasing our energy. So while it is much too early to understand the true impact of the Trump administration, let's take a look just to close out at what he did during his first 100 days in office. With the coronavirus pandemic and the other economic issues facing us, it still remains to be seen what will happen. But we can look back and see what he accomplished and what he didn't accomplish in his first 100 days.